Hello, my name is Dick Moore. I'm a committee member of Berwick Community TV, and I'm your host today for Project uh, Remembrance, a tribute to past and present members of the armed forces in appreciation of the sacrifice they have made. We are doing this production to learn more about our veterans, what they've done, and what they plan to do also in the future. And it's kind of a thing where we want to get it down for posterity and we'll be doing more veterans as we go along. And today we'll be speaking with Brian English. He's a U.S. Marine veteran and also first vice commander of Charles S. Hatch, post 79 of the American Legion. Welcome, Brian. Hi, hey, thank you. It's good to be here, Dick. All right. And uh, with that, Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself. As I said, my name is Brian English. I uh, live in the town of Berwick. I'm currently employed for the Veterans Administration where I work as an LPN at the Summersworth Community-Based Outpatient Clinic and I do the lab there. Um, it's uh, an honor to be uh, interviewed today uh, about my service and uh, look forward to telling a little bit about my story. Well, great. Why don't we start off and tell us about your service record? Sure. Um, um, after I graduated from high school in Anderson, South Carolina in 1980, uh, I'd been in the delayed entry program since 1979, joining at the age of 17. Um, I graduated uh, high school on May 26, 1980. On June 2nd, I was at Paris Island for fun and sun in the warm, lovely swamp country of South Carolina. Um, I did uh, basic training there. Uh, then went on to Millington, Tennessee uh, for my A school and training where I worked as an F4, or trained as an F4 armament technician. Uh, for those of who may not know, an F4 is a fighter that's no longer used. Uh, it's a picture of one here or a number of them on the flight line. It was a state-of-the-art fighter in its day, originally designed in the 1950s but it had extended surface with a lot of modifications and I was one of the last F-4 ordnance guys in the Marine Corps or actually in the world, uh, at least in the United States. Um, and, and they flew in Japan a little bit later but uh, it was being replaced but I always liked the old bird. Uh, we had a, a saying about the uh, F-4 that uh, it was made a lot of noise <laughs> and uh, it made a lot of noise and and carried a lot of, of bombs and missiles and stuff and enjoyed working on them. Okay, if I remember right, the F-4 had both a pilot and a real? And that's correct. Um, there were two air crew. Uh, the pilot uh, was in the front seat and then behind we had what was called a real or radar intercept officer. Um, the pilot flew the plane and the radar intercept, he, he uh, controlled the radar, used it for a semi-active guidance system for the uh, Sparrow missiles that were used in air-to-air. -air. Uh, he was also in charge of electronic warfare and, and was an extra set of eyes, you know, to help, sure. you know, uh, yeah. them. Um, we did a lot of, uh, I, as I said, I was ordnance, so I did a lot of the loading of the bombs and munitions, missiles, worked on the missile systems. And I did a total of eight years uh, in the Marines uh, from 1980 to 1988. I want to go back to the F-4s. Did you ever get a chance to have one of the pilots take you up, take you for a ride? <laughs> uh, how I wish, but no. Unfortunately, <laughs> that, that changed. Uh, when I was in the Philippines in 1983, I was at the time I was a Lance Corporal, and um, I had uh, received the... Uh, Marine of the Month and a meritorious promotion to corporal and the month prior to that um, the Marine of the Month got a chance to fly in the back seat and so that month they changed the policy and so alas I never <laughs> got a chance to fly in the back uh, yeah. as much as I might have wanted to yeah. but uh, uh, I, I that was uh, something that I would have loved to have done but never did. Sure. So why did you join the Marines? Well, my father was a World War II veteran. Uh, he served in the Army Air Corps. Uh, he was the first sergeant in the Pacific. Um, little side note here, um, he was uh, in charge of the military police company that uh, ended up guarding uh, the atomic bomb in the Mar uh, Marianas Islands, and he was the first sergeant of that company. Um, 
And it, I'm always interested in aviation and, you know, him being Air Force and always liked flying and that kind of thing. But the Marine Corps sort of appealed to me because it was, uh, you know, it was a tough branch of service, you know, and Marines have... Yes, Semper Fi. Yeah, <laughs> Semper Fi <laughs> for sure. Um, and uh, I think in one kind of sense, you know, it was like when Dad went in the Air Corps, you know, but I'm going to go into Marine Corps, you know. Yeah. And... Um, just uh, sort of on a uh, spontaneous decision, walking by the recruiting office, and just walked in. And before I knew it, I was uh, yeah. So Brian, tell us about your early days in the service. You know, basic training and the mental adjustment you had to make for boot camp and that kind of stuff. Um, well, um, for those who may have seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, it was the closest. Uh, portrayal of Marine Corps basic training that I can imagine and it was pretty brutal. Um, a lot of what went on you know post Vietnam in that area era it was starting to change my time in the 80s um, you know Reagan had just come in the military was was sort of being looked at a little bit differently than it was in post Vietnam but it still had, particularly in the Marines, the residual of a very tough kind of uh, thing with a lot of hazing and that kind of thing going on. I was very fortunate, having grown up in South Carolina, that I was acclimated to the weather uh, in South Carolina. Um, I grew up playing baseball and stuff like that in the summers, and so the heat and everything, uh, I did well with heat and humidity. Um, but, uh, you know, we did three months, June, July, and August, and. Uh, pretty intensive training, uh, but I, I learned some pretty good skills, you know, uh, that really helped me throughout life, learning how to adapt, how to uh, uh, do things like, uh, you know, I, I remember one time my wife and I, we were just doing some target shooting one time and uh, with uh, 22, just, you know, just plinking sure. and stuff, yeah. and, and I was sitting there nailing this, this paper target and everything at a very high rate of, sp of fire. And she had, was really good at sort of slow fire, but um, really at rapid fire, you know, I was, I was pinging this target very well, and she goes, where did you learn how to do that? And I said, you know, weeks and weeks in Paris <laughs> Island, so. Um, but uh, then, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to, you know, being a kid from South Carolina to get a chance to travel. Being in an aviation unit, um, by the way, here's, you asked about basic training. This picture was taken uh, during my last phase in basic training. This was my uh, picture in the dress blues uh, in basic. Um, I wish I still looked that young, but um, <laughs> alas, we all have... <laughs> would, it, would it still fit? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, it, it would not. Oh. Uh. Sorry, I dropped that. But um, I was very fortunate that uh, being in the aviation unit, we got a chance to see the world. Sure. Um, 1982, uh, we deployed to Denmark. Absolutely beautiful country. Absolutely loved it. Uh, had a just wonderful time there. Ended up going to Denmark twice. We traveled all over the United States uh, getting ready for various deployments. Uh, and then the two Westpac deployments, which is the Western Pacific. Uh, we were based out of Iwakuni, Japan. Uh, while we were in Japan, we deployed to Korea. Um, we were in 1983 and 85. This is a picture of me on the flight line getting off the plane in Yechon, Korea. And um, Japan, Philippines, Korea, Okinawa, saw all those places as well as Puerto Rico a couple of times and all over the United States. So uh -huh. I, I, I do appreciate the fact that I got to see the world. So, how long were you in the service overall? What rank did you achieve? Okay, um, well, as I said, I spent uh, eight years in active duty in the Marine Corps from 1980 to 1988. And after I got out, I went into the reserves and served for a while in the reserves. I wanted to, go, in 1990, uh, during the, right before the Gulf War, I wanted to go back on active duty, and at that time, they weren't taking any prior service people uh, as new enlistees to go back on uh, active duty. So. I transferred to the Army Reserve and went on active duty uh, in the Army Reserve where I served as a recruiter uh, during the Gulf War. I was actually stationed stateside uh, in Fitchburg, Massachusetts uh, as a recruiter during that period. Can you give us a basic timeline of your service assignments throughout your career? 
Um, well, um, 1980 in basic training, and then uh, 1980 and 81, I went to Millington, Tennessee for A school. Uh, after uh, what is A school? A school is your primary MOS school. So MOS is your military occupational specialty. Right. So I was a 6534, which is aviation ordinance, F4 ordinance specific, and um, missile technician. And uh, after I graduated from that training, uh, I was stationed uh, to Marine Corps Air Station, Beaufort, South Carolina, which is just across the way from Paris Island. <laughs> and, but it was close to home. I lived in Anderson, South Carolina, so I was able to go home. Um, while I was at Beaufort, and we st I stayed there until I PCS, or permanent change of station, in 1985. But, but during that period of time, we deployed. I did the two Westpac deployments and then other deployments around the world. Uh, including the Top Gun school. We went out there twice and it was a time when Top Gun was in the news and everything. Yeah, sure. And our planes yeah. went to Top Gun and uh, uh, our pilots trained during that. Uh, then in 1985, um, I had made sergeant by that time. Um, well, excuse me, in 1985 initially, I, I was a corporal and I re-enlisted and uh, got a permanent change of station assigned to I&I &I duty where I served uh, in the um, Marine Aircraft Group 41 Detachment A, uh, where I served as Postal NCOIC. Uh, this is a plaque that I received there, and I served there from September 27th, 1985 to September uh, 29th, 1988. And this, um, while I was there, we received the a commendation from the Inspector General of the Marine Corps, and I, I was promoted to Sergeant. Um, and uh, while I was there, I, that was at the Naval Air Facility in Andrews Air Force Base, uh, which is on the other side of the base from what, uh, where the Air Force One is. And it's now Joint Base Andrews. At the time, it was divided to the Naval Air Facility on one side, um, and then the Andrews Air Force Base on the other side. Uh, but while I was there, stationed in the D.C. area, I uh, met my wife. Um, and she, at the time, was working as a, in the National Institutes of Health as a biochemist uh, for the Laboratory of Immunogenetics. And uh, she was there when Anthony Fauci came to NIH, so, <laughs> so she knew him. Yeah. And, uh, sorry? No, sorry, you're doing fine. And so, um, at that point, um, we got married, and I knew that... Uh, with all the deployments that we had, and I saw the devastation that the deployments had done to a lot of the marriages, and, and I had a fine wife, and uh, so I decided that we would end, end my time active. Uh, sure. And then we ended up moving to uh, New Hampshire and, mm -hmm. and uh, had a, raised our family in New England. We now sure. live in Berwick, but uh, our two daughters. And Sounds like you had quite a career. Uh, I want to go back to the Air Force for a minute. This is something I think that that's, I know it would be real interesting to me. So you say you worked on those planes. Now I understand from my reading that the F-4 was one of the most powerful uh, jet aircraft we had at the time. It had twin engines that could go over Mach 2. I'm just really curious about working on those things. So what kind of quality control you had so you didn't leave a wrench or something in it to bang around oh, or stuff like that? Yeah. You know? Well, um, it's a good, good, great question. Um, the the F four, as you stated, uh, was a very powerful plane. It had two J seventy nine dash ten engines in it, which uh, produced tremendous horsepower. Uh, and uh, you know, I still have tinnitus from hearing the the, oh, the sound of freedom. Wow, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, quite a bit. But um, what you asked about the, the inventory of, of, of tools, and uh, we did a number of things to prevent uh, damage. Um, uh, first of all, uh, in our toolboxes, we had what was cut out shadows that we would take um, tape, or uh, it was colored tape, if you will, and we would cut out the pattern of a wrench or cut out the pattern of whatever tool that we were using. And then in each toolbox, you inventoried and made sure that every tool was in that pattern was covered by the tool. So we literally, uh, before we packed our stuff together, had to inventory because leaving behind a wrench in a, in a jet airplane yeah. is not very good. Yeah. Um, we also did what was called a FOD walk. Uh, FOD is foreign object damage. So the jet intakes ha uh, have the potential of ingesting uh, 
loose objects. Right, yeah. And so uh, we would literally walk the flight line looking for loose nuts, bolts, screws, rocks, whatever that could possibly create damage, either from the intake or the jet exhaust, picking up an object and then hurting someone with that. Yeah. When uh, Did you ever happen to be in front or near one when it was revving up to full thrust and feel the suction of the, you know? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> generally speaking on the ground uh, at, at a holding, they wouldn't be full throttle. Full throttle, they probably wouldn't override the brakes. Okay. Um, we did um, rev up, if you will, and, you know, I they were, had parachutes on the back, and uh, I would literally go behind the plane, feel the jet blast and everything, grab the parachute, wrap it around the wing, and, and I climbed over the airplane while it was turning. Part of my job was to take the uh, arming pins out of the weapons. We had chaff and flares, which were on the, um, this is the F-4 here, so on the side of the F-4 up here, there was an area where chaff dispensers were. Chaff is, is shredded aluminum that gets flown out to uh, help deflect radar from enemy radar, and also the flares, which are uh, fired out to stop heat-seeking uh, missiles. So there were safety pins before the plane took off that I had to take out. There was also arming on the, the bombs and the missiles, the, the safety pins. So mm -hmm. I was under, around, on top, and over while the plane was turning. So I, I mean, I literally was sitting on the edge of it 12 inches away from the intake when it was yeah. turning at low, low throttle. Well, thanks for that interesting story about the tool control and everything. And uh, I, I remember back in the early 70s, there was an Air Force demonstration team, the Thumb Thunderbirds, and there were four of them flying, and they all went into a mountain, you know, a dive. And after they, uh, you know, found out what went wrong, there was apparently a nut or something that had gotten loose and it had locked the elevator, mm -hmm. and it, it couldn't climb, and the trouble is, all, all four of those, all three are on the leader. They're not even looking where mm -hmm. they're going. They're just watching him, and I'm, that was an unfortunate accident. So well, that's, that's real interesting how you guys control things. And one of the things that we did, too, is for the nuts and everything. So any, uh, each of the locking nuts and everything that we had had um, holes in them, if you will, and we would take uh, 32 to 1,000 safety wire, and uh, we would take the the wire and run it through the and then attach that to another uh, nut over here with a cross pattern with a twisted 32,000 safety wire and we use something called safety wire pliers and so you would connect this over here bring this around run it through there and then we twist it mm -hmm. so what it would do is is keep one turning this way, one turning this, so right. keep them from backing off. If one off. tried to unscrew, it would actually tighten the opposite, and exactly. they, couldn't, they couldn't go anywhere. Exactly, so yeah. that's safety wire. And then one of the things that you just had to do, and you can look at my hands, you really hate it when a guy, because we had to pigtail the ends of the safety wire, and your and an F4 was designed with, with maintenance was not in mind when they designed the F4. <laughs> I mean, there were some components who had to literally go upside down, and somebody had to hold you to drop into to grab a module out. Um, and you're probing around in the dark, and if someone did not bend the safety wire, we called it pigtailing, turn the safety wire in, then you would snag yourself on the safety wire, and, and somebody would answer for that because you know, it, it was painful and you'd, you'd hurt yourself with that. But uh, guys who worked on F4s were called phantom fixers. I have a, something here on my hat that you probably, most people when they see it, this is an F4 here, but right below it there's a little spooky looking guy with a tooth. And we refer to that as the Phantom Fixer. And uh, so everyone who worked on F4 Phantoms uh, knows what that is, but most everybody doesn't. Uh, but that's uh, a little something that I'm sort of proud of having worked on it. And this, is, by the way, is the second Marine Air Wing because we were part, I was with VMFA 333, we call it Trip Tray, uh, the Fighting Shamrocks. And being Irish, that always helps. And um, the, we were part of the 2nd Marine Air Wing as well. What were some of your most memorable experiences during your entire time in the service? Just a few things. Well, I have a, a really funny one for you today. Right. Um, we were at 29 Palms, which is a uh, training ground in the middle of the desert in California. And we were there for an operation called CACS, which is a combined arms exercise. So we're working with uh, what we call, referred to as the grunts. Now, the grunts are real Marines. Air Wing guys, we were sort of laid back compared to other Marines. And 
Uh, they, we, our hair was a little longer, we weren't as spit and polish and all of this. And a lot of times the, the, the senior NCOs, like the sergeant majors, really did not like the air wing guys. They loved our close air support, but they didn't like the way that we were sort of laid back. So every morning during this operation, uh, now, get you, when I'm working on these airplanes, they're flying during the day predominantly. So we're working all night getting these things ready. You know, mm -hmm. we're cleaning the VOM racks, we're, we're uh, setting them up, getting them armed, doing all the maintenance checks and all this kind of stuff on us. So we're working all night. And uh, so early morning, it's time for us to go to bed. Well, the, the grunts were all working on their schedule, and this one particular sergeant major, he loved getting on a loudspeaker, and we were down in this tent city, which was down here, and the airfield was up here, so we were trying to sleep, and he loved getting on this uh, loudspeaker at, at zero dark 30 in the morning, and waking up everybody going, good morning, Marines, good morning, Marines, and start doing all this you know, oorah stuff early in the morning when we were trying to sleep after working 12 hours. So after two weeks of that, we were exhausted. So the, um, after the end of the operation, the, uh, <laughs> we were given liberty, three-day liberty, which means that we were able to go into town and stuff like that. Well, all these grunts went in. The nearest city was Palm Springs, California. So they all went into Palm Springs. And of course, being Marines, they went to hit the bars and they came back, you know, wasted, right? So it's early on Sunday morning. They're sleeping off the... Uh, uh, trying to sleep off this this uh, hangovers and stuff. The grunts are. So we had a nearby airfield called China Lake, which is about a hundred miles or so away in California. And in an F four, that's nothing. A <laughs> hundred miles is like you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's no time at all. Yeah. So we had two F fours over in uh, China Lake take off early in the morning on the day after these guys went out and got drunk. And the, all the air wing guys are lined up on the airfield because we know what's going to happen. So there's a tent city down below the airfield and all these, these grunts are like groggy, hungover. And these two F4s come in smoking, flying on the deck, screaming full speed right over the tent city. And one of the guys, the back seat, Rio's in the back seat, because he got woke up with this Good Morning Marine stuff too, and he was sick of it. So he got in the back seat, and he's on, this, on the, the, the radio going, Good Morning Marines, Good Morning Marines. And they zoomed right over that tent city, and they, they didn't know what was going on. Just boom. I don't know if they hit us. I don't think they hit a signing boom, but they were smoking. And just flying across the air and all these these grunts started piling out of the tents and it looked like ants coming out of an ant hill because they they didn't know what was happening to them but yeah that was that was sort of That's fun. interesting so anyway you know it sounds like you had downtime on occasion and stuff when the planes didn't need maintenance stuff so how, how did you and your fellow soldiers entertain yourselves as far as like movies and stuff like that. And also, you guys must have played some jokes and pranks on each other on occasion. Oh, like this joke, you know, like this one. I mean, that was all joke. I, you know, honestly, we had uh, liberty in some of the most extraordinary places in the world. Um, being young Marines in the 80s, there was a lot of drinking and, and stuff. You know, <laughs> there's stories about Subic Bay that I will not relate here. Okay. Um, uh, but we did, you know, movies. And I, I, one of the things I always thought was interesting was seeing movies in foreign theaters with English subtitles. That was always sort of fun. <laughs> and I never will forget one of my favorite movies was A Bridge Too Far. And if anyone knows the story of A Bridge Too Far, it really didn't end well for the Allies. Right. Uh, that was the Operation Market Guy. Yeah. Montgomery, <laughs> Montgomery came up with that one. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it really didn't turn out very well. But in the Philippines, when they showed the movie, they didn't go to the end of the movie. They stopped after they took the bridge in Nijmegen, which, was, you know, as you know, they didn't go on into Arnhem. So it yeah. looked like the Americans yeah. took the bridge. And it, and it was almost like a propaganda thing because Marcos, because they wouldn't uh, show the Americans looking bad. Selective editing. Selective editing. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I saw Poltergeist in Denmark, which was interesting. I, was, I you know, went to a movie and saw Poltergeist in, in Denmark with English subtitles. That was sort of interesting. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, today we're speaking with uh, Brian English, and uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we're back and uh, to interview Brian some more. And Brian, one thing I'd like to talk about, you know, working on those, all those jets and everything, it had to be some dangerous stuff going around, big jet engines and JP-5 rocket fuel and things like that. What kind of problems did you have that might have developed, you know? Well, there were, there were, there were a couple, <laughs> but one that stands out to me, um, I was a young Marine and uh, we were doing what was called an alpha strike. Uh, it was training, it was in Yuma, Arizona. An alpha strike is when you get a coordinated strike from multiple squadrons uh, with uh, integrated air. Uh, so it's a lot of planes on the flight line armed with bombs, missiles. Um, so we had, at that time, in this strike, at least two squadrons of F-4, so that's about 24 F-4 Phantoms. We had some OV-10 Broncos that were loaded with white phosphorus rockets. We had A-6. Uh, a, a six intruder, which could carry thirty, forty thousand pounds of bombs, all loaded with bombs. Fuel trucks all over the place. Um, helicopters nearby, and we had what was called a wet start. So to start the jet engines on the F four, we had an external um, compressor, uh, auxiliary power unit that we would hook up, and what we would do is it would uh, turn the turbines begin to turn the turbines. And then when they would start our power on the plane, um, uh, they would inject a fuel air mixture, much like a fuel injector or a carburetor, into that area. And then there were igniters within the compressors that would ignite the fuel air, and that's what got your engine started and burning the fuel, this fuel air mixture. Well, on occasion what happened is it, it would malfunction. This rarely happened, but it, this particular day, where the fuel air mixture cycled through the plane and the igniters did not ignite it. So uh, this fuel air mixture exited out the back of the engine, the exhaust area, was a raw fuel air mixture, highly combustible. And this plane was armed with, uh, I vividly remember, uh, six 500 pound bombs. Oh boy. And next to it was were 12 other planes loaded with 500 pound bombs. And uh, other planes all over the place, fuel trucks, all that kind of stuff. Well, the fuel air mixture had this billowing white cloud and it caught on fire and uh, in a flash. And so we had two pilots in that plane. These bombs were already fused. Now, now the bombs, you know, are 500 pounds or about 250 pounds of explosive in each bomb and a lot of it was metal oh. in addition. But, but we, the dangerous part with these is we'd already had them fused and de -ar or armed, ready to go. And the fuses are much more sensitive to fire than the, the bombs themselves. Uh, bombs literally can sit in a fire um, for up to five minutes before they cook off and explode. But the fuses are highly volatile. Delicate, yeah. And they have veins on them and, and the veins spin and that's what arms the fuse as, as the bomb is falling, the veins spin and it arms it. So if those things start to spin, they'll arm, but even the fire would set the fuse off. And if the fuse went off, the bombs would go off. Well, this plane was on fire. And, and to be honest with you, I was a Lance Corporal at the time, probably 19 years old, 20 years old. And my first initial reaction when this plane was on fire and all these bombs in place, was to haul ass. <laughs> I, uh, the, the, the proverbial crap was about to hit the fan and I just started running, you know, and that was fight or flight and I was booging. And the staff sergeant from my hometown, now when I, I'll back up, when I grew up in Anderson, South Carolina, I had known his mother when I was working in a, in a cotton mill back in the, in the town and his son was in the Marine. Well, this son of his and I were always stationed together. For whatever reason, we went everywhere together. But he was a staff sergeant at the time. I was a Lance Corporal, so certainly outranked me. And uh, he, but we've known each other. I knew his mom, you know, we're from the same hometown. Uh, and he had joined like two years before I had. And he sort of grabbed me and said, Brian, you can't run fast enough to get away from this. <laughs> he said, you go down there and start uh, clipping off the, the fuses, putting safety wire in the fuses, and unscrewing those fuses and defuse those bombs while they're fighting a the fire. So I, I, my initial reaction was not to run toward the problem, but I, after that I went running right where this plane was on fire. Meanwhile, we had fire crews, we had the, the flight, engine, you know, flight uh, line crew, which were trying to get the pilots out of the back seats. Uh, 
they were throwing halon, which is a fire retardant uh, suppression. And while they're fighting the fire, I'm on the plane. I am unscrewing fuses out of bombs and fixing the vein so they don't spin an arm. And um, yeah, the pucker factor there was, <laughs> was pretty high. <laughs> Uh, um, the same, the same staff. Yeah, the same staff sergeant. The same place, Yuma. Probably next year or so, I had a situation where I was almost crushed by a thousand-pound bomb because they, they, we carried these on these trailers. And so he told me to unscrew the the, the lug bolts that held these. Um, what we called a cradle, which had each cradle held two <coughs> one thousand pound bombs like here. And on the other side of the of the thing, he'd take a fork took a forklift in and lifted up a cradle with two thousand pounds worth of bombs. Well, when he took the weight off of that, of course the thing shifted <laughs> and I had literally unscrewed the nuts on the per his instruction. And so the tail the 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 whole trailer suspension tilted towards me. And I had literally stepped away from that when this thing fell from about five foot in the air. Two thousand pounds worth of bombs hit the oh, hit the right. hit the right. tarmac. Made a hole where the bombs dented the tarmac, and I was about <laughs> that close <laughs> to being squished. So oh, it, it was boy. dangerous. I, I did it's end up hazardous. Yeah. It was hazardous. Yeah. I ended up hurting myself when I was in Japan, 1985. Uh, I'm service connected for injuries that I sustained on a, a maintenance stand where I slipped and hung upside down on a, on a flight line. Oh, wow. and, uh, and so I have a disabled veteran. Yeah. Uh, wasn't in combat or anything like that, uh, but from uh, working on the, the aircraft. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it was some crazy times. And fortunately, we never lost anyone. We never lost a pilot. You know, we've had some injuries and people have hurt, uh, but we managed to get that fire out and. Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, we're all in one piece yeah, still. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll tell you, it sounds a lot like Brian had an interesting service career, to say the least. Uh, tell us a bit how you, yourself, and others, you know, in the service with you were, were best supported. How do you feel about support, both military support and supplies and communications and stuff, and also civilian support, you know, people at home, cards and letters. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit of how you felt about all that. Um, as I said earlier, I was in the early 80s, sort of post-Vietnam era. It was a little different, I think, now. Um, people, I, I, and I appreciate the fact that I believe people are come to appreciate the military a little more now than when I first went in. Uh, I did get letters from my mom uh, quite often. Um, and... Uh, Honestly, um, I'm, 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 I can just say that I'm really glad things are a bit different because I don't think we got as much of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I do, I do appreciate, you know, particularly in the states, there were certain uh, families that uh, uh, there was a friend of mine uh, and ended up at a. Uh, uh, befriending and, and I felt like I could go over to his house all the time so there were there were people who and a lot of them were retired military or something you know and they you know I was always welcome there and I, I did appreciate that and then until I had met my wife there was always you know at least somebody that you know I felt like you know was there for me but uh, one, one gentleman in particular Bill Ragel, he was a government employee down in the Washington area was just uh, 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 very supportive, you know, and sometimes I'd just show up at his house and he'd always make some coffee and we would sit and chat and stuff. I always appreciated that. So uh, at the end of your service career, how did it feel to leave the armed forces? I mean, to go back into civilian life? Um, by, when I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, I, I missed some of the travel. Um, and as I said, I went back on active duty in the Army. By the time I finished my Army time, uh, you know, I had a family at that point. Uh, I was ready to move on with my life, and uh, I was glad that I was able to be there for my family. Um, I'm grateful that I was able to use some of my uh, benefits that I received to go to nursing school in 1994. and. Uh, and I, after I'd get now, I 
used that to, even though I had a family, I was able to go to go to school, uh, St. Joseph's in Nashua, get my nursing uh, as an LPN uh, program, and I uh, um, was grateful for that opportunity. And but I'm glad now to be, you know, as a veteran, to be able to work with other veterans. Um, I work in the uh, for the VA at the community uh, out, right, out patient clinic in Summersworth, New Hampshire, and I've had some very good, just wonderful opportunities there working with veterans. Mm -hmm. and, and there's one, if you got a quick, got, we have time, I'd like to relay, and, and I think it's so important, you know, for anyone that's listening to this, uh, we have a, a lot of veterans who are suffering uh, from PTSD and for other issues, and the suicide rate among some of our veterans is extremely high. Um, if you know a veteran, uh, don't be afraid if you, if you see something to, to ask them. You know, it's not a bad thing to ask them. Are you considering suicide? To be up front and ask that question directly. Uh, because what we want to, to do is to um, sort of stop this, you know. And there was, a, there was a, an incident, in the, I, I obviously can't mention the name, but uh, I was working in 2019 in the fall. And we had a, a gentleman who come in, and I was checking him in for his appointment. It was a primary care appointment. And just noticed that something just wasn't right, Dick. You know, his blood pressure was high, his pulse was high. Uh, this guy had been a retired, or a retired colonel. Uh, come to find out, he had gone over and worked in Afghanistan, working uh, in, in a hospital over there, and was, was taking care of uh, kids who'd been hit with IEDs, he's taking care, of, he was a pediatrician, and uh, taking care of other people. And uh, this gentleman was able to, because I was a veteran, uh, he was able to, when I just stopped what I was doing and say, talk to me, well, what's going on with you? Are you okay? And he, for the first time since 2007, admitted to the fact that he uh, had severe PTSD was suicidal and was thinking about ending his life. So we stopped what we were doing, we got him help, and we, we got him in touch with the mental health counselors, we, and we got him other services. A year later, this gentleman comes back in my office. He's been making his appointments, he's been doing everything he's supposed to do, and he's, he's making it. And he brought a card that someone had written him. As I said, this person was a doctor. And he had received a card from a family member who, of a child that he had saved their life, the, ch the child's life. Had sent the kid down to, to stabilize him, sent him down to Boston, got him care, thanking him for saving that kid's life. Mm. And he literally said, Brian, if you had not been there for me, then this child wouldn't have been there. So yeah. if I never do anything else, yeah. you know, that... Makes you feel good. It, huh? it was worth it. Oh, yeah. And if there's one thing that I can say, you know, that, you know, if you have a veteran, you know, be sensitive to them. You know, they've gone through stuff that a lot of people may not ever understand. And, and regardless of where they serve in combat zone, there's, there's accidents, there's uh, military sexual trauma, there's other things that create PTSD that cause problems for people. Mm -hmm. And we need to be, uh, as a community and as a, as a nation, be aware of these things and take care of these veterans. And I'm grateful to have a job where I can do that, uh, take care of people, uh, and, and it helps me with some of the issues that I have to deal with. And uh, also, working with veterans in the American Legion and the VFW, uh, it, it's, it's a great opportunity, and, and I would just suggest for anyone out there, if you're a veteran, if you're not in one of these organizations, if you're not in the VFW, if you're not in the American Legion, we need you, we need your veterans, your, your brothers and sisters need you. Um, and would appreciate having you there to, to help us and, and help, you know, do things for our, our community of veterans. What you say about veterans is true, and I'd like to relate a couple of things about that because I've had extensive, you know, experience with friendships and people I knew, uh, you know, during work with veterans and everything, and it seems a lot of what you're saying is true, and I think part of the biggest problem with veterans is trying to relate to other people what they went through. And I think that is a big part of the PTSD and, and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of people I talked to when I was in the service just could not relate to what they went in Vietnam. You just can't understand it. 
And I think today a good couple of, there's a couple of good examples of that. And one was the movie Saving Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. If all of us, uh, you know, that saw that movie remember the horrors of the opening scene on D-Day and the graphic, uh, you know, dragging arms and people blowing up and everything. And several people I've talked to, that's just an approximation of yeah. what they went through. And they have such a hard time with it. And uh, it's why a lot of veterans don't, it's not that they don't want to talk about it, they don't know how to make you feel what they did. And Vietnam is a big example. I mean, you know, everybody calling them baby killers and this and that. And it's taken the country a long time to, to, to gain, uh, uh, you know, that respect back for veterans. And it's, it's too bad. It's a shame, really, because I think all of the Vietnam uh, protests and stuff were, were basically, for the most part, young college-age people and so on and so forth. But I think the bottom line is, is we need to be able, as a society, to you know, have the right to protest and, and everything. That's why we, we fought the wars, and that's why we did it, is people have a right. And, and we also need to look at, we need to come up with other ways as a, as a country and as a society to, to solve our differences. And uh, no one, I don't believe, dislikes war any more than someone who served. So uh, I uh, hope that anyone who is listening will, work on towards both of these means and we need everyone to come together and, and, and help in, in something like this and, and uh, but, but to reach out to the veterans who served is important. To, to say that, that, that that's what, what you know veterans uh, fought and died for and served for that that's a, that's a wonderful thing and I think people will certainly take that point on I did and we respect you for it. Uh, did you make any close friendships in the service that continue to this day? Um, I, the best man, I'm, honestly, is, uh, in my wedding, we were in touch for quite a while, but I think I've fallen out of touch for the most part with people I served with, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Now, I understand that you're the vice commander of the American Legion, Charles uh, Hatch Post uh, 79. And uh, tell us a little bit about that, you know, and how would you encourage others, you know, not only to join uh, the American Legion, but the armed forces too, what is, you know? Well, I think, that first of all, uh, as far as any veteran, I think belonging to a, a service organization that you can work with, uh, regardless of your, your viewpoints on, on, on whatever, you know, we need people and to help one another. Um, they're veterans who uh, haven't, lack community services. Um, one of the things that I'm working on is trying to help veterans getting the, the uh, adequate compensation. Uh, a lot of veterans with issues, military um, related uh, diagnoses are not receiving compensation for those, are not receiving care for those and I think this, that's important and one of the things that we as American Legion and as the VFW uh, can do is to help people to get um, services that they need uh, and also in honoring the history of what's uh, done you know uh, whether it's Flag Day or Memorial Day or Veterans Day um, I think it is important and to help relay you know again the uh, as a nation you know we have many different differences um, uh, none of us are alike in our points of view but one thing that we can come together in is in helping one another and, and uh, recognizing, you know, our veterans are, are serving uh, a nation and uh, helping retain the freedoms and the opportunities that we have. Um, and uh, I, for anyone who is looking f for serving their country in whatever means, you know, the armed forces um, is certainly an area where uh, if it's the right thing for a person uh, that they can serve, um, there's opportunity there, there's benefits. For a young kid from Anderson, South Carolina, without a lot of, of opportunity, I ended up traveling the world in places I never would have seen, and I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
Now, as far as the American Legion, I understand you uh, you folks do a lot for the town as far as... Uh, we do. You know. Every uh, veteran uh, who is an E4 or below receives... Uh, uh, we see Christmas gifts to them. We also have uh, honorary membership for them. We do service towards uh, uh, scholarships uh, with uh, Noble High School. We have um, uh, helped veterans in the community who need things. We help build a ramp for uh, one of our, our veterans who's not even a member of, of our legion. But um, uh, there's a lot of different things that we do to help the community in, at large as well as our, our veteran community. Great. Well, before we close, Brian, is there anything else that you'd like to bring up or discuss before we finish up? Well, just thank you for the opportunity. And if you have a veteran in your life, uh, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, hear their stories. You know, we all have stories to tell. Uh, for those who have not served or, uh, I would say, I always say when someone says, thank you for your service, and, and I, a lot of times I will say, well, thank you for giving me something worth serving. Um, I am proud to have, uh, to have served, but I also appreciate the fact that we have uh, such a wonderful place that's worth serving. And, 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 and a people that I believe that despite our differences, despite uh, a lot of the things that are going on in the world that, that uh, we have uh, so much potential. We've done so much and, and I just anticipate in the future uh, that we as a nation and, and as, as people will, will come together and, and, and support their communities and support each other. Thank you very much, Brian. It's been a pleasure. It's been and, my pleasure. Uh, it, it's been great. So. In closing, I'd like to say that uh, we've been interviewing uh, Brian English. He is a U.S. Marine veteran and first vice commander of the Charles H. Hatch Post 79 of the American Legion. Thank you all very much.